Welcome, Richard, giving us an interesting talk from now on. Okay. Yeah, you, you want to start out with what happened last night? I'll get into that very quickly. Okay. So thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share some of these things. I want to begin with talking about the, the context of the way in which this work developed because it's very different than for many of you on this call. Here's a little bit of background about me. I've been at this for a while. I've been in research and manufacturing and now I've been consulting, written some books, articles. So I've been pretty active in this whole area of trying to understand what's going on, but really from a pragmatic point of view, looking and seeing and then find to figure it out. So to begin with, I want to share the context. And much of what I learned began when I was the manager for this chemical plant in Bell, West Virginia. The Canal River is shown there on the right side of the picture. The plant's about a mile long, about a third of a mile wide. The valley is about 800 feet deep, which means if there's a chemical release, it goes up the river or down the river. And you can see the people live right at the edge of the, uh, of the plant, let me get my laser pointer. People live right here along the edge of the plant and the same is true for, at the bottom. Last night at 11 o'clock, they had an explosion at that plant. Four people got hurt, one of them seriously burned. I don't know much more about it except that they, apparently the fire is now out but the people in the communities nearby had to shelter in place for five miles in each direction, which means you go inside, you shut your windows and doors, turn off your air conditioning if it's on, and listen to the radio for the instructions from the emergency people. So this happened last night. So this, what I'm talking about took place in a, this kind of a context where this was possible. And actually what got me started in this whole journey and shifting from being a command and control manager was a fire. And I'll get to that shortly. So I came into this plant as a strong top-down manager. I had to drive people to get things done. Trust was low and there were a lot of dysfunctional behaviors. Fighting, arguing, people picking on one another, harassment. There was a lot of stuff going on that was not good. We were making some progress, but it was slow. And the safety and environmental performance and earnings were terrible. We were one of the worst performing plants in the DuPont company at the time. But then we had a fire. Not like the big one I just showed in the picture from last night. It was in a building that burned up a dryer for one of our products. The place was a mess. Our people got it out. We got back up into production in just three weeks. One of the things that I watched happen was that the people and the way they behaved instantaneously changed. We became a self-organized, high-performance team without any training, without anything. People knew how to do this. They just did it spontaneously as they self-organized around getting the fire out, doing the dismantlement and repairs and getting back into production. The people did amazing work. We only had three weeks of inventory, but we got back into production and did not miss shipments. And we had no injuries or incidents during all this work of repair dismantlement, restoration, and startup. But then after the crisis, we all reverted back to the dysfunctional behaviors. And I'm saying, what happened? Why can't we work as high performance teams all the time? We did, we did a great job during the crisis of the fire, but then we reverted back. And so my transformation began with the fire and those kinds of questions. What was going on, why? One of the things I began to do was to walk the plant. 
I walked the plant for three or to five hours a day for seven years. I talked with the people, listened to them, watch what was going on, ask questions. How can I help? Can you help me? Here's what I know. What do you know? What's going on? And it took a while to begin to build a level of trust where we could exchange information. Sometimes we argued and sometimes everything was fine. And we learned together and we began to do new things together. As people talked to me about the work they were doing and I was asking questions to how to get it better, they'd come up with good ideas. So we'd explore that and see what's possible and how they could carry it forward. The change happened almost immediately. But it began with little things, like people picking up trash or people helping each other. Less bickering, less fighting, fewer grievances. Then some bigger things happened and once in a while something very big happened. I began at that time studying John Bennett's systematics. John Bennett was a British philosopher, died about 1974. He studied the work of George Gurdjieff, and Oshpensky, and he was thinking about communication and how organizations and how does communication work in the structure of language. I also bumped into the science of chaos and complexity and realized that Bennett's teachings gave us the language and models for us to talk about being in chaos and complexity. So I synthesized these. I spent a lot of time observing and studying the patterns and processes that I saw. What were people doing? Just, you know, what's going on? Why are they doing it? Who's doing what? These are the references to that Bennett's work if you should want to follow up. As I did this walking around work and talking and listening and being with the people, our injury rates dropped by 96%. And the people were able to sustain that performance for 17 years, 12 of which was after I left. The emissions to the environment dropped by over 95%. After I left, they bounced, they rose tenfold, but we brought them way, way down. The people did. Productivity went up 45% and earnings went up 300%. So while I really didn't understand early on the importance of walking around and talking and listening and sharing and learning, these are the kind of results that began to come out. And what I learned was that the natural processes of self-organization and how work gets done come in, came into harmony. And I'll talk more about those ideas, but these are, I think are very important. So, that's the context in which I have learned a lot of these things, which I want to share with you today. But I felt it was different than the, most of your backgrounds and where you've lived most, I, I believe. So early on, I was in top-down command and control management, treated the people as if they were interchangeable parts of a machine. We had one-way communications with little feedback. You know, I'd issue some pronouncement, but I would hear very little coming back. This led to deep-seated frustration, anger, and low morale. People don't like being treated like parts of a machine. And that shows up in surface problems like people being talked at rather than talked with. Having injuries and incidents, bullying, harassment, resisting change, blocking information flows. All those surface problems, we often chase around to try to fix, but they're not, that's not where you fix them. We had to go deeper. Just doing and chasing these things around, it's like playing whack-a-mole at the state fair, but it was not really solving any of the problems. And we at the top really didn't know what was happening in the plant until I began to go out and walk around. And we had this phenomenon of work is imagined versus work is done. Work as imagined is when I sit in my office and write a procedure to do a piece of work and then give it out to the people to do the work. I've not talked to them. I've not listened to them. I've not looked at what they need to do. I just say, here, go do this. And they dig it and they try to do it. But the conditions are never quite like I thought about in the, lab, in the office. 
So they have to begin to improvise. They have to begin to do workarounds. And if they do it successfully, I take credit for being a great manager. But if the workaround doesn't work, then I blame them for it. And that's the kind of a dynamic that makes people really, really unhappy and creates a ton of problems. And gradually I began to realize this top-down process was not working. And I had tried it at two earlier plants, but just had not developed an understanding. So I had to go deeper. So I began to have questions. Why do people hold back and do as little as possible? What's really going on? How do things interact and function? I can understand the parts, but what about the whole? What's going on across the whole facilities? Why can't we operate as a high performance team like we did in the fire situation where everything changed? And people knew how to work this way. I did not have to develop a training program. They know how to do this. And we began to move towards natural systems. I had been studying complexity and Bennett, reading Margaret Wheatley's work. Margaret Wheatley and I developed a good relationship and she helped me a good bit. And we began to develop ways in which we could see the whole of what was going on, the parts and the interaction of the parts all at the same time. That gave us a huge big step forward compared to the command and control approach. And I came to realize that organizations are complex adapting self-organizing networks of people. Our body is a complex adapting self-organizing network of cells. Organizations behave like they're living systems. People want respect. They want to be listened to. They want to feel valued. And I find that everywhere that I've worked. People want to be talked with, not at. So I can say, Stuart, how are things going? Rather than, Stuart, go do this or whatever. People want to know what's going on and be included. We shared almost all information. The only we, material we didn't share would be private personnel things. We opened it up so anybody could talk to anybody. We cut through the silos. So there was a lot of conversation going on and it was okay for people to talk to someone who wasn't their boss. It was okay to challenge me. It was okay for them to tell me where I was wrong. And often I was, but I learned with them and we learned together. People contributed and we could co-create our future. This idea of co-creation is a big piece of this living systems approach. All of us have inputs. All of us can be there. We do not have to be afraid of this idea of self-organization. And we created order and focus for the business and openness and freedom for the people at the same time. The metaphor here is that my job in walking around and talking with people was to help them understand the playing field. What's the container in which we're doing our business work? And when they knew the container, our mission, our vision, our values, they could then begin to make decisions about their work. And as long as they were within the container, it was fine. And people began to do extraordinary things. One of my big challenges was to learn to live with the ambiguity of not knowing what was going to happen next. And that's part of the nature of complex systems. We don't know the details. We can't forecast the details. But I found that if we begin to understand the underlying patterns, they're much more stable and much more reliable in terms of being able to function and work together. So I spent a lot of time working on the patterns and the processes and what's happening and understanding them. So in the course of this, we developed a 360 degree view of what was happening. Everybody was involved. Everybody was talking about things. The information was being shared. People weren't hiding things. We began to all pick up what was going on and share information from all across the facility. And most of the surface problems that I referred to earlier went away. The grievances went down, the bullying went down, the harassment got much less. I had to take a tough position against some of those behaviors, but they got less and less. 
And so he began to study, you know, what is this going on here? Suppose we begin to look at the organization as if it's a living system. One of the characteristics of living systems is that there's self-organizing going on all the time. We don't have to make it go on. It's going on all the time. Our weather self-organizes, the rivers self-organize, ecosystems, forests, prairies, wetlands self-organize. I kept bees for 20 years. They self-organized. They taught me an immense amount about complex systems. It's keeping bees. Termites self-organize, as do herds and sand piles and earthquakes and flocking birds. It's everywhere going on. It's not something we cook up. It's going on as a natural part of nature. And what I found was people are self-organizing all the time. Community clubs, new businesses, national organization for women, cocktail parties, tea parties, prayer march, unions. Everywhere you look, people are self-organizing. For the most part, people aren't being told you get into this group or that group, or you got to talk to Lowell, or you can can't talk to Stuart, or you can't talk to Jason. There's none of that going on. People are making decisions for themselves, just as we are in this group. The Club of Remy is a self-organized group. We don't make it self-organized, that's what we do. And there's a huge amount of energy in this. If you think about being at a reception and you're talking with people and you're watching people move around and groups form, reform, people move. The level of the noise in the room is often so high we can hardly hear ourselves talk. But in a command and control type of organization, as the new manager, I would come in and say, hey, wait a minute, you're all in the wrong groups. I got to rearrange you. Oh, well, you got to go talk to Stuart and all that. What do you suppose Stop. happens to the energy in the room when I do that? It goes through the floor. People begin to leave. A lot of people go to the bathroom and never come back. People withdraw from conversations. There's huge energy. And so part of the role of a leader is how do we engage this energy of the natural tendency. Organizations are complex adapting self-organizing networks. And they're doing that all the time and behave as if they're living systems. You have to be careful. They're not necessarily a living system like the body, but they sure have a lot of the characteristics. And I found that the easy way to stay out of endless conversations about whether they're living or not is to say they behave as if they are. Nick gets us out of that crack. But what I began to learn was that we could harmonize the natural process for self-organization with the natural process of how work gets done. And I'll talk about that. Engaging the natural processes enables us for the organization to come together and to move very quickly and effectively to accomplish the things they need to do. I discovered and created this tool, the process enneagram, which is a metal model that brings these natural processes together in a simple and powerful way. It's a way to bring diverse groups of people together in dialogue and to solve the problems that are important to them. Now the process enneagram is not this anywhere night like the process enneagram for personality. So if you know about that, just Put that aside. It's not going to tell you anything about the process in your life. We use this tool in both dialogue and doing at the same time. We're talking about what's going on. We're learning to work together and we're doing work all at the same time. It's not as if we go to a classroom and learn how to have a conversation and then go back to work. We are in the work and we are engaged together in doing it. And the whole and the parts and the interaction of the parts become visible and we can work together. This is a picture of the process enneagram. Whenever I work with a group, it begins with a question. It always begins with a question. How do we improve safety? How do we quit having a fire? Whatever. With respect to that, the group talks about who are they? They talk about what do they want to do? They talk about the problems that are facing them, that are preventing them. They talk about what are their relationships together? Do they trust each other or not? They talk about their standards and principles of behavior, it's sort of like the ground rules. They actually do the physical work. 
They create and share information. We talk about that. They talk about how do they learn and discover new potential. And they talk about the context and the structure. The context is the outside world. The structure is the inside world. And so people can be in a conversation about these things with respect to the opening question. And these conversations can go quickly. Let me show you an example. This is an actual example of work I did with the mayor and the leadership team for the city of Niagara Falls, New York on December 29th, 1999, the day before they were to be inaugurated and installed in their new offices. And the question was, how can we be the best leadership team for our city? So they talked about who they were and what they brought to the table. They talked about what they wanted to do for the city. They wanted to be honest and holistic and they wanted things to improve. They acknowledged the old culture and the new culture and the challenges they have. And the city of Niagara Falls has a terrible long history of corruption. It used to be one of the mag centers for the mafia at one time with a guy named Magadino. They talked about wanting to become interdependent and trust to build. They co-created these agreements together about how they're going to work. This is the work that they decided they wanted to do. They wanted to create and use information and respect confidences and share. They wanted to commit to learning and spending about 30 minutes a week talking about the map they created. They had to recognize the context was the state government which would impose and change rules and laws for the state but force the cities and towns to pay for it. So they didn't have control of a big piece of their budget. They had to pay attention to the citizens and taxpayers and internally they wanted to be structured as a team. This was posted onto a four by eight foot chart on the wall. Each time they began the meeting, which was weekly, the city manager asked each person to comment briefly about how did we do against what we said? Nobody was making anybody do anything, but this kept the awareness up of their agreements and they could hold each other accountable. Now the process of self-organization, who are they? What are their relationships and what is the information? So as I walked the plant hour after hour, I was sharing information. I was learning about things. They were sharing information with me. We began to do it with more respect and caring and trust and interdependence built. And people began to see how their work fit into the success of the whole, which gives meaning. So this is the self-organizing leadership process. The process by which work gets done, and it's always this process. This is what I want to do. These are the things I have to pay attention to. These are the problems I'm going to run into. This is how I'm going to organize myself. This is how I'm going to do the work. And now I'm going to take some time and learn what I did and get better and come back again. So for example, rather than, let me go backwards. Oops. If I want to make it, I'm hungry. My intention is I want to make a carrot cake because I like carrot cake. I have to go to the recipe for the carrot cake and see how to do it. What are the ingredients? How long do I bake it? What kind of equipment do I need? I come back up here. Do I have the ingredients? Do I have the equipment? I have to set up the kitchen so I can do the work. I bake the cake. I eat a piece. Do I like it? Good. If I don't, then I modify it and I do it again. All work that I found follows this pattern. This is what we want to do. These are the ground rules we need to have, just like the fire brigade. We had a fire, they had to get it out, but they came as professional firefighters. They did the work, they attacked the problems, organized themselves to look for the people to be sure the building was, didn't have anybody in it as well as put the fire out. They put it out and then they did an after action review. All work follows this pattern. This is the natural process for how work takes place. And I saw that play out in the fire. I've seen it play out many times as I begin to learn to look at, through the world, at the world through this lens. And because the leadership team was talking and working together, services for the city improved. They took 16 million bucks out of a $62 million budget and didn't have to raise taxes for three of their four years. As you remember I said earlier, the state imposes a lot on them. So this money was being absorbed by the state edicts and new stuff coming down from Albany. 
Embedded within the process Enneagram are three leadership processes. The self-organizing process I just shared. But there's also operational leadership process where people got the problem like the fire, we got to organize ourselves and we got to put it out. And strategic learning, like we're bringing in a new business operation like lean manufacturing. And what are the new principles and standards? And the leader has to move among these leadership processes being very conscious of situationally awareness. And most of the time you want to be in the self-organizing process. This is a kind of a complicated chart. This is the process Enneagram I showed you. This is the self-organizing leadership process, sharing information, building relationships of trust and interdependence, helping people see how they fit in and find meaning. When people find meaning in their work, great creativity and energy get released. Every now and then you have an incident like a fire. We got the problem. We got to put the organize and put it out and do the work. And we go through this thing. We deal with the problems. We organize ourselves and do the work. And now and then leaders have to move to that. And now and then you bring in something new. Part of the picture is covered here, but new things come in and we have to get new principles and standards and learning. And as long as these things are balanced with the self-organizing process, we're okay. But if we overuse this operational process, it becomes command and control. And you can see in this diagram why the command and control system is so weak. We have incoherence between the work and the issues and the problems. They aren't being solved. People just said, here's the problem. Here's how you organize, go do the work. But this is not being resolved. And nobody's talking about information, relationship, and identity. That's all ignored. The people side is ignored. This is all about doing specific tasks, which are decided by the people at the top. If these processes can be aligned up with the natural process of work, you get a picture like this where there's no incoherence and all the points are being talked about. This releases enormous energy and creativity. This get, blocks it up and screws it up. The incoherence is terribly destructive. So I call what the leadership dance. The leader needs to move and have high situational awareness. All the approaches are needed. Each of them has problems with strengths and weaknesses. If the operational approaches are overused, we get command and control as I talked about. If the strategic approaches are overused, we tend to get cults and inside groups and outside groups, and I know something that you don't know, and that creates problems. If we don't connect the self-organizing process with doing real work, we just sit around and sing kumbaya and nothing happens. So we can't just self-organize and feel happy and great. We have to self-organize around the work that's before us to do. So the work and the dialogue have to be integrated together. The use of the process Enneagram integrates these and harmonizes them in a simple, easy to use way. And while the diagram looks confusing, I've used it with people at all educational levels from the illiterate to college professors. Challenges change from group to group, but everybody gets it. And in 30 years of using this in workshops, no one's ever walked out on me. And they all come back the next day if we go two days. The self-organizing pr process connects the points of zero, three, and six. Work process connects the points one, four, two, eight, five, and seven, as I showed. These are dynamical, they interact continuously, and it's a learning cycle, and it builds sustainability. That's why they could sustain the safety performance for 17 years at a world-class level. We went from the worst in the company to the best. And at the time, DuPont had a high value for safety. Now they don't. Now it's a different company. They've done, things have changed a lot. So here's the process Enneagram. Here is the process self-organizing leadership, sharing information, building relationships, and helping people see how they fit in. And this image of me and the importance of meaning which really struck me one day when I was walking the plant. I got to know the people reasonably well. 
And the fellow who was an insulator was shuffling down the street, walking as slow as he could. He was all covered with insulating glue, goo, which insulators do when they're mad about things. They get sloppy. He shuffled past me. We greeted each other, and I watched him go by. I said to myself, I'm paying this guy 50,000 bucks a year. He's doing as little as possible. But I also knew at home, he was the mayor of his little town. He was very active in his church. He had a youth dancing group, which we took all over the state of West Virginia. And he did that for free. So at home, he's working his bum off. And at work, he's doing as little as he can. And I'm paying him a ton of money. That was a big eye opener for me to see that. I would not have seen that had I not been out walking around. So the process of self-organizing is to share information, treat each other with respect and consideration to build trust. Part of this is when you screw up, you apologize for it. You don't try to BS your way through it. You help people see why their work is important for the organization. The leadership process is to co-create it with the people. Co-create it is important. We sit down with who is in the system and who needs to be involved. Sometimes it might be a customer. At our plant, we have brought in the neighbors, talked with them about what was going on, and they could help us see things from their perspective. And that was often quite important. We had to agree to the principles and standards. We had to identify the problems, understand the world in which we're operating as well as how we're working ourselves inside. Do the actual work and then take time to learn from it. And then go back again. So now this is a learning cycle. This is a cycle for continuous learning for the organization. And you can use this process Enneagram on any complex problem. You don't use it for a simple problem. Like when I get up in the morning to get dressed, that's a simple problem. That's not too complicated for me. A production line or a payroll is a complicated problem. Many steps, but if you do them correctly, you get the right answer. Complex problems are ones where you have a diverse group of people talking about something that nobody's quite sure about. And so we have to explore it together and find out together how to do it. And that's where the process Enneagram is the best use. So why does it work? I think the natural processes of self-organizing and work when they get integrated and become coherent, release enormous amount of energy and focus. It's co-created by the people, with the people. There's a leadership role in this. Though. The leaders have to help set direction and vision and that kind of thing. But then how do we actually do all this is co-created. The discipline integrated process of dialogue, it's easy to use. It feels right and makes sense. I've never had people fight me with it. Meaning, trust and action emerge. It engages the natural tendency and energy of nature like an expert canoeist reading the water in a river and being able to draw the energy from the river and successfully negotiate the rapids. So I'll stop at that point. Richard, I want to thank you for that. I, I would like to call on two people that are part of our conversation here to comment on what they heard from Richard. Uh, the first is a person who's joining us for the first time from uh, California. You're up early, Dr. Meshkadi, who's at University of Southern California. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you could sort of comment on what you heard and uh, explain a little bit about uh, your work on safety and uh, nuclear power plants, et cetera. Good morning from Los Angeles to you. And thank you very much, Lohan, for inviting me to hear Dr. Knoll's fantastic presentation. It, uh, it's really certainly worth that, that I woke up at six o'clock in order to make it to this fantastic presentation. Uh, and uh, excuse, excuse me a minute. Did you see the picture of the fire at the plant that happened last night? Yes, in fact, I took a screenshot of that and I wanted to mo learn more of, about that from you. The reason is that uh, I send that invitation to Lowell uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday. I'm uh, moderating a panel discussion of two friends and two distinguished people. One of them is the Honorable uh, Kathleen Lemus, the chairwoman of US Chemical Safety Board. 
I had a meeting with here and the Honorable Rajasthan. <laughs> Possibly they will be investigating this accident, and I don't know if she is going to come to my panel tomorrow. I can send you the invitation. It's open to public. It's by National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Board of Human Systems Integration. Lowell sent me those, and I've already registered. So thank you. Perfect. Uh, but, but being honest with you, I didn't know about this uh, unfortunate accident last night. And I don't know, in light of that, the Honorable Lemus can make it to my panel or not. If, if she doesn't come, my only other panelist will be Honorable Robert Sumwald, NTSB. <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask you a question, Dr. Adolz. Uh, I have followed DuPont at least for the last 30 years, because as Lowell mentioned, my work is on safety of complex system. I have been to Chernobyl in '96. I was a member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, Lessons Learned of Fukushima. I have been to Fukushima Daiichi, Daini. And then I was also a member of the uh, National Academy of Engineering panel that investigated BP Deepwater Horizon uh, offshore platform explosion. In fact, we had a member of our committee uh, whom I learned a lot from her, Dr. Jocelyn Scott. I think she was at that time in 2009, chief engineer of DuPont <laughs> and she was coming from Wilmington, Delaware. And here is my question to you that DuPont has always been almost like a poster boy of safety for me. And I, when I was learning about safety culture after Chernobyl, read a lot about safety culture, uh, <laughs> uh, written about that a lot. But we, when my student 20 years ago, 25 years ago, they were asking me about what's a good model of safety culture, I would point out, I said to Pont. They have 100,000 employees around the world, 40 countries, this, 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 perfect. And <clears> then <throat> I was hit with a basically baseball bat on my head uh, uh, in January, 2010, at exactly the same plant. When you showed me the photo of this plant this morning, I have a copy of, NTL, of, of the CSB report that I made a case study of that. In a matter of one month, January 2010, there were three accident and releases, January 22, January 23, January 23, and then CSB did an accident investigation of that, that I made even a, that I made even a, a, a PowerPoint for my complex system safety class that I can show you the, this is the, uh, the first uh, slide of that. I don't know if you can see it or not. This is the che chemical safety board meeting that I am basically taking the camera of my iPad so that you can see that this was the thing. There was one accident here. It was at the same plant. It's the same plant, yes. One accident here, yep. another accident here. Another accident. And they killed a guy there. Yeah, and here was is uh, again. I I only rely on uh, uh, this this report of CSB, and I know the investigator that who went there. One of the investigator, Johnny Banks. I worked with Johnny Banks and several other CSB investigator on the investigation of another major accident, which is BP Texas City Refinery March two thousand five that killed, uh, I think, 18 people, injured 180. And, and the, the, the key issues over here, they say, was mechanical integrity, allow management, operating procedures, and company emergency response and notification. I don't want to bore you with, the, with this case study, but was my question was, Dr. Knowles, what happened to my poster board? What happened to DuPont? Your observations are very good and they're very distressful for me because that's the same plant. When I said that they maintained a safety performance for 17 years, it came to an end when they killed 
Doug Fish with the Phosgene release. And what happened was when I was there with, working with the people and we brought down our injury rates and emissions together, people learned the processes. But when I left, the new managers came in with command and control processes and they broke the system apart. We treated occupational safety and health and process safety management together. They're different components of the safety work and everybody was involved. The engineers were involved with the operators and talking about how to run the processes better to get better yields, to have less waste, to have fewer upsets and whatnot. And we all worked together and we brought our emissions from the, to the environment down. When I got there, they were emitting six and a half million pounds a year to the environment. When I left, we were down to about 275,000 pounds, which is a lot, but if you think of, and that's a year, that's like about a half of a tank truck of gasoline a month being emitted. And on a facility that side, we're just having breathing and tanks and whatnot, that's not too bad. When I left, the occupational safety and health would continue to be run by the people close to the work, but the managers pulled the, the process safety back to themselves. They began to cut back on support. They began to cut back on inspection schedules. They allowed things to drift. They allowed the back orders to go up. And I know this because I've talked to the people, a lot of them. The managers came in and were telling key people, well, I don't need you. I can run this place without you people. And the whole piece came apart and the process safety gradually fell apart and it finally culminated after 10 years in that series of incidents you just shared with us. John Breslin, who was head of the board, and I are, were, are good friends. And John called me up and said, what the heck's going on? The same question you had. And what was going on was that DuPont was pulling way, way back, having more and more MBAs trying to run things. <laughs> MBAs, there's only one school in the United States, MBA school in the country that I understand teaches anything on safety. My daughter has an MBA. She had one HR course and that was on the cost of HR. So the MBAs are good on the numbers, but they don't understand the people side of the business and the importance <laughs> of safety. And you've got to live this. And DuPont was world-class, but then it fell apart. And you didn't mention the fact that just shortly after the terrible problems at Bell, DuPont had a re chemical release at the plant in LaPorte, Texas he killed four people and things had gotten so shabby around their process safety that the fire truck, the plant fire truck trying to respond to the incident broke down and couldn't get there. So the, what happened was that they had totally taken their eye off the ball. They allowed safety to shift and they continue to do that. And you may have noticed that DuPont sold their safety services business off. It's a separate company now. So they, these changes were taking place and they were falling apart. And they don't fall apart just immediately. Usually things come apart a bit here and a bit here and then all of a sudden they fall off the cliff. And so it was distressing. And what you talked about was real. And I know the people who went through this and I've talked to many of them. I visited the plant many times. People. Okay, I, I would like to sort of change direction to- uh, Excuse me, was that, help, was that helpful? No, Excellent. Mean, and John Burstyn ear must be a burning because if you see that I ended my, my PowerPoint by a comment from him because this is what he said, uh, MBA uh, Honorable John Burstyn said, and then he ends that in light of this, I hope that DuPont officials are re-examining re the safety culture throughout the company. John is a good friend and I, he visited me here several times. Again, his ear must be burning this morning. <laughs> John and I have worked a lot together. The Deepwater Horizon problem is almost the same as the Bell problem. They worked very hard on occupational safety and health and were doing well, but they left the process safety piece fall apart because Absolutely. the people at the top trying to run it have the problem of the work is imagined and work is done and they ignore it and they get caught up and the business drives, they get caught up in schedules, and the people down close to the work do not have an environment where it's safe to speak up and say, hey, wait a minute, don't do that. And our people at Bell, when I was there, could do that. 
I had a shift supervisor one night when I went into six in the morning to talk with him about things. We'd had terrible thunderstorms. And he said, we're going to have more during the day. So I've shut the plant down. Thunderstorms can cause electrical upsets and that can cause process upsets. So on his own, he shut the plant down. He could do that. But in the Deepwater Horizon or Bell nowadays, they can't do that. People are afraid to do that. Okay, let me just sort of change to a second person, uh, Hamish McDonald. I'd like you to ask some questions on how we can turn what Richard Knowles talks about practically into intelligence. Hamish. Yeah, I, well, first of all, the, the whole presentation was excellent. And what I'd like to say, I've kind of worked in two spheres. One sphere that people knew about and another sphere that people didn't really know about. The area that people did know about was that for 16 years, I was director, one of the director of trustees of the International Martin Rescue Federation. And uh, before that, I had sat in a so-called expert witness in the Royal, the Royal Commission Ocean Ranger and quite another, a number of other things. Within the IMRF, which is the body that, that represents the maritime rescue across the world and aeronautical rescue in the maritime environment, one of the problems that people talked about was how to respond to mass rescue situations. And what you identify... How to respond to what? Mass rescue situations. Mass rescue. Okay, thank you. One of the problems with mass rescue situations was that everybody thought they had to have standard operational procedures, command and control top down, just as you talked about. But when you get into these situations, if you limit the line, you don't actually understand what's going on and you don't actually allow people to have the capability to use their capabilities. It's not necessarily about not having equipment. It's more the knowledge of what to do, how, what a situation is and how to deal in that situation. The other area of work, it, generally speaking, people don't know about is that for many, many years, I uh, developed and ran uh, special operations, terrorists, and irregular warfare, and develop network structures. And in recent years, if we go back into history, the development of certain types of specialist operators, basically the starting of the SPS, SES, was it, it took some gillies from the, from the farms, from farmers, from criminals, people who had self-discipline and expertise and they allowed them to develop and, and work within a structure. That doesn't really happen that way anymore. And people don't want to go out with what they think is a safe command and control structure, right from the prime minister or the president down. I must be in charge, he must be in charge. And it destroys really what the potential is. And I can That's give right. a little example. This is a little example that uh, I will not name the parties. I will just say that these are, these were representatives from very well-known specialist groups. And it was not just the UK, America, it was a, a group of 12 people I brought together from specialist operators to run a program. And part of the program was that they'd got to come to where I lived, to where I operated. They had no country clearance to do so. They had to bring whatever they needed with them. And we, they had to set up a advisory training scheme to train some local operators in a non-military role, in a search and rescue role, but at the same time as that, to develop a capability that was not understood by the people that were there to stop uh, an infiltration happening. So they had to identify people who could help them. And part of it was that they identified that 
there were lookout people. There were people they could use, like auxiliary coast guards, like people that were looking at the bird sanctuary, that people had all sorts of capabilities. So we ran this so that one night when the operation was going to carry on, they had to have all these people do all the information gathering, get a plan laid out, and give each one of these people a task to do. So they did that very well, excellently. And it started, and they had a command place and the man in the command. After about five minutes, one of the auxiliary coast guards put in a VHF call saying, there's a car arrived in the car park. Very good, thank you very much. 10 minutes later, there's another car arrived in the car park. Ah, good. Five minutes later, the same person came back and said, the lady in one car has got out and got into the car with the gentleman. This went on for about 20 minutes. And by this time, the head of the so-called information gathering got a bit pissed off that he was getting interrupted from his thoughts of the command and control. And the next time the man put a VHF call in, he said, the man is now with the woman and they're going away. And the person in charge of the intelligence gathering and information source said, don't speak to me about this again until you've got something worthwhile to tell me. And at that point in time, the whole exercise was destroyed. That's everything, right. everything is important. You just don't know when it's important. You also made reference to nature, and that's exactly what it was. Many years ago, and I've been lucky to spend time in all sorts of places, crawling about doing different things, but I spent time in the Japanese mountains with some women, old women. And I was taught about nature. And one of the things that I was taught, I was put in front of a small stream with a small square board. And I had to, in my view, I was asked to paint the picture. So what I did was try to paint what I saw through that box. And I saw the little stream and I saw it turning around corners and I saw there was bubbling water and this, that, and the next thing. Great. And then for the next week and a half, the two old women started to tell me what it actually meant. And to look on the stone and where the stone was and the bubbling water going around it, the bird would sit. And the bird would sit because there the food would come down the top. And at the side, the back of the stone, that's where the fish would be because fish are lazy. They lie just off the current, but they use the current to accelerate so they take anything off the surface. Basically, that was a natural environment. And when I've been with Inuit, when I've been in Australia and other places, that is what we need to understand. We need to understand how networks from the very basic level intertwine and develop each other. And we can use that at the highest level possible. Unfortunately, in today's situation, people demand command and control. They demand structure top to bottom. And they just don't listen to what is the most important people and they don't see or hear what are the most important factors within it. So I commend what you've said. I just wish that a lot of people in a lot of places who make decisions would get their heads out their asses and their fingers out their ears and <laughs> see and hear what they need to see and hear. But the most important thing is not to be aware of things, but to understand things. And there are very few of these people actually understand. Academic learning is a great thing. But I can tell you, you can go into the wilds in Mali, in the wilds of Somalia, where there is no education. Education has got nothing to do with IQ. It has nothing to do with understanding. It's only a means of expanding that. And that is, I think, the lesson we need to try and put over. Everything you said in there, I can double, that triplicate, it was exactly right. I just don't understand why people want, don't really want to accept it. One of the things that 
happens with this, and I try to let people know is the results get better very fast and they get really good. I've had people tell me when I share with them that we cut our injury rates by 96% that I'm lying. Yeah. I've had people come to the plant. I let them walk around the plant. And after two days, they come back shaking their heads and saying, what did you do? People yeah. don't understand this and they refuse and they get stuck in their old doggone habits. And we're sleepwalking. We're sleepwalking. Too many of us are sleepwalking through this. So Richard, yeah, apologies. I miss uh, if I could just, uh, uh, Jamie, if I could just ask Lute uh, to comment, because a lot of what Richard uh, talks about is dialogue and doing and the relationship. <laughs> and you've just written a book on conversation. So it might be interesting your comments. Lute from Amsterdam. Are you there? Hopefully. Maybe not. Okay, Jamie. Um, just whenever Lute is there, I happy uh, yield to him. Uh, Richard, so an important component, I think, are the business schools because just I spent time in strategic management doing a PhD at Purdue <laughs> University. And Margaret Wheatley, was actively discussed and Michael Lizak was at our conferences uh, just talking about complexity. And I had a professor, Caroline Wu, who had close connections with the Industrial Organization School. And she was talking about the importance of working together and, and, and all these things and DuPont was being discussed. And so you have all these researchers that need project or PhD students more precisely. And, and actually also Hamish, they were looking at everything, including um, does the army and the Navy does they look at things to study for planning and organization? And so I'm wondering, what do you think happened that they, because they're also the ones who are teaching the MBAs. So, so how is that disconnect there? Because they, they would come to your organization, I guess, to want to do a study of, of what made it possible. And then the MBAs, do the opposite of what the research is telling. Do you uh, care to comment? And, and it applies also to the educational institutions in the UK, I guess. Does the universities, uh, are they like helping or are they actually muddling the things? I think that, I think there's a, a there's a significant problem that people don't really want to address. And the problem is that, for example, after 9-11, we've moved on so much with technology, but technology didn't develop technology. Human beings and our awareness developed technology. We forgot that we have to learn the basics first. And we have to learn the basics from everything and everybody. And that gets fed in to the systems which may develop technology that's useful. If you look at, for example, gathering information, after 9-11, there's all sorts of electronic capabilities. You can study a Nats arse at 6,000 miles if you want. <laughs> because you can see it and hear it, that doesn't mean so you understand it. The basics is you have to have the ability on the ground to see, hear, and understand. And before that, you have to be able to just listen and listen to hear. And nowadays, there is a tendency to say that the, the important thing is what's already written. Well, we wrote the books. They have to be written anew. But to write them anew, we have to have the knowledge and information to write them anew. And it's not well liked because we all defend ourselves. We're all biased. I defend myself. I'm very biased. I can't help but be biased. But there has to be an open door. 
And people are frightened of that because it can take away command and control. You just well, one, one of the things that the process Enneagram does on this right hand side, these are the people issues that we have to talk about. Yeah. When we transition over, we're over into the mechanical information world. But we move back and forth all the time. And so we are bringing both the people and the technology, whatever it is, together simultaneously. But it all comes out of the people. You're right. People write the programs. People generate this stuff. The people, we are stuck over on this side so much of the time and forget this. And this is the people that releases it, particularly developing an agreement about how to work together. That, that's almost like the prince coming in to wake Sleeping Beauty. When they begin to realize this, they wake up and things change. And it can change fast. I was working in a big sugar mill in Australia. They were making 65 railroad cars a day of raw sugar from 25,000 tons a day of sugar cane. They had 350 men. They're having about 35 serious injuries a year and killing a guy every 12 to 18 months. And the attitude was, well, bad stuff happens. After working with them for three weeks around this kind of thinking and using these models, their injury rates went to zero. And it stayed at zero for nine months. I lost track after that. But the people decided they didn't have to keep doing all that stuff. Not the management alone, but everybody together saying, you know, we don't have to do that. So we brought the people side together with the business operations side. So let's open it up uh, to everybody for questions for Richard and any other one who has spoken. Uh, Jerry Chandler here on the iPhone. Uh, I would like to uh, compliment Richard on his uh, excellence of his presentation. Uh, I would say that I worked uh, for 10 years uh, with the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health uh, in the area of uh, toxicology and safety uh, and did the uh, public health documents on creating uh, a safe working processes for individuals. Uh, so I, I, past 30 years, I've been a consultant with the International Association of Firefighters on protecting firefighters in safety and health uh, issues as they fight fires. So uh, I, I'm generally concur with Richard's presentation. However, in listening to Richard's presentation, I come up with a deep personal conflict in values. And this values is that if uh, the talk itself, it seems to me to deny the notion of second order cybernetics and command and control. Uh, most everything you said depends not on command and control but on cooperation among the individuals. So the question is, how do you justify second order cybernetics in light of your talk? Okay, let me speak to that because it's a dynamic that's going on. As the plant manager, I could exercise command and control as I chose. And sometimes I did, but I also had to be very careful and use that primarily to say, this is the direction we're going We've got to work safely. I don't have a right to make my living at a place where it's okay for you to get hurt. I'm not going to put up with that. So my command and control things tended to be around, here are the standards. We've got to live up to them. Now, how can we figure out how to do that together? And people seem to be okay with that kind of an approach and opened up. And it was important for me to set the conditions where people could speak up People could feel safe in talking. People could challenge me and tell me when I was wrong. And I, sometimes they told me that, and I often was. I had to listen to what they were saying. So I had to work with both the command and control piece, but temper it very carefully and not crush the people who were doing things. And to when people made decisions, support them. An example, we wanted to convert our process control systems for our big chemical processes from the 1950s to the 1990s technology. The traditional way would be for DuPont engineering department to come in, give us an estimate, build a second control room, build a parallel process, 
run it for a couple of years and then change it over and let the operators run it after they worked it out. And then the operators take two more years because they didn't get involved and they don't like it. And it takes a while. We decided that we didn't have time or money and we're not gonna run parallel. And that we did 16 conversions of processes. We never ran parallel and we never failed. And that was because in these meetings, my job was to keep the communications open, asking questions about how are we doing? Are we listening? Are we helping? What do you need from me? How can I help? And the people pitched in and everybody was committed to make it work because they were doing the work close to the work. I did not ever tell anybody how to fix a pump, for example, or run a process because I don't know how. People knew that, but they also felt they could talk with me I was out in the plant. I did not do this in my office. I had to be out where they were. I climbed distillation columns because people have to do that now and then. I'm afraid of heights. And I would do it on a nice calm summer day. But people at least appreciated that. And they recognized that if push came to shove, I'd have to make the decision. But most of the time I went with what the people were doing as long as they were using the processes that we were talking about. So there's a command and control piece of this that's going on. This is why I call it the dance. We've got well, to, we've got Richard, to understand that and I appreciate you see it as command and control as a very upper level process where you are the supreme commander. But uh, <laughs> it brings me a, a second concern uh, about the relationship to second order cybernetics. Uh, the second concern uh, is that, you, as you noted, you are, I have a PhD in organic chemistry. Uh, this processing plant was an uh, organic chemistry processing plant. You had the deep knowledge of the nature of the chemical processes. You had intimate knowledge of the chemical reactions and how they uh, would be carried out. And uh, thus you had great expertise that was, uh, shall we say, subliminal to uh, all the decisions that you were making. Uh, th do you think this is necessary to be uh, for second order cyberneticians to have that level of knowledge of their uh, supreme commander and control situations? Let me answer that two ways. For the people who are running the particular organizations, I think it's incumbent on them to know what's going on and to be deeply involved and have a sense of what's going on when they just walk into the place. I could walk into a building and tell from the sound what was going on. You couldn't, you couldn't do that because you weren't close to it. So on one hand, those that are close to the work need to understand. However, what I have found as I've been consulting around the world is that these systems and processes, if it's command and control or participative are so consistent that it's astonishing. And so I can work in a bank, I can work in a nursing home, I can work with the city government because I'm paying attention to the ways in which people choose to come together to work. And that is very consistent things we can talk about and help people. So it doesn't matter what the organization does. It's how do the people choose to work together? And this is where I can help them and bring in the points that we've talked about today, that we've got to blend both the, the people side and the business side, that we've got to bring in all these things. The leaders have to be situationally aware of when to use different approaches together with the people. So it's, it's a dynamical thing and that I, we can help people with. So it's a, two answers. I hope that's, did that make sense? Rachel. Thank you, it's very good. So open it up, other people, comments, criticism. Uh, okay, Jamie, you first. <laughs> you, you're mute. You're muted. You're still muted. A follow-up uh, to earlier question and in the Zoom session. So one, you mentioned Margaret Meet Wheatley and she's a consultant, I guess more, but, but did you ever work with business school professors who wanted to do research? And a number two, in the nineties, everyone was talking about Jack Welch and his super, 
successes at GE and and his whatever decision making methods. And did you ever pay attention to that? And that's also uh, a question for Dr. Mescati. And also, do you think he may be responsible for having pushed the MBA mentality? Let me talk a little bit about Margaret Wheatley. As I was beginning to do this work and walk around the plant, I did not know what I was doing as I understand it now, but it was making a difference and we were getting better. Someone I saw on a NOVA program about chaos, we clicked book on chaos and they were talking about pendulums and electrical circuits. And I thought this must apply to social structures as well. And then I bumped into Mark Michaels, who was leading the Chaos Network, which was looking at the application to social systems. And he invited me to their second annual Chaos Conference in 1992 or 91 in Santa Cruz. I told my boss I was going to an organizational development conference. When I got there, I discovered the hotel was called the Dream Inn, and I almost fell over. If my boss has ever found I went to a chaos conference at the Dream Inn, their suspicions would have been concerned, you know, <laughs> you know they, they would have thought he's, he's gone nuts. But I met Meg Wheatley and I read her book, The Leadership of the New Science and felt like I was coming home. And I called her and she came to the plant and she and her sidekick, Myra and Kellner Rogers, walked around the plant for two days. And she came back and she said, you're doing what we're talking about which was a great relief to me because I wasn't insane after all. I didn't know how to talk to people. Now I was beginning to get a language and an understanding. So Meg then invited me to participate in her self-organizing systems conferences at Sundance and I went out there. So she and I worked together till about 2000, 2001, talking about these kind of things. And I spoke at her conferences and I got to know Fritjof Capra and some of the others. Margaret, was very, very helpful for me to try to understand because you were talking about metaphors earlier. Mm -hmm. I use metaphors a lot. You know, strange organizations are complex systems. They have a strange attractor. I call that the bowl. It's the container that holds the organization. So it's a metaphor. Is it really a container? I don't know. What does it look like? I don't know. But there's something there that holds the organization together. It's a vision, your mission, your principles. As people understand that, they can work within that container with a great deal of freedom around their work. So it's a both and situation. So a lot of the command and control things, going back to that question, was around being sure that people understood the container. The people understood what we were trying to do. The people understood why we were trying to do it. That we were sharing information. It was not okay to withhold information. It was not okay to withhold the truth. So that's the command and control part where I took I came down on people sometimes pretty hard. But when you're out walking the facility, meeting with the people in their space and talking with them, you never know what's gonna happen next. I used to have weekly business meetings, two of them, hour long meetings in a shop or a control lab or an office. First 10 minutes were how we're doing on safety and health in the business, then opened it up. Every question was okay and every question was answered even with, I don't know, or I can't tell you, but I'll get back to you. I took my secretary who took shorthand. You cannot tape record these because people's voices would be heard. So it was safe and they trusted her. So she did things in shorthand. In one of these meetings, we've made a lot of progress towards talking together, but I happened to be meeting with a group of riggers, about 40 guys who prided themselves as being the most honorary group on the plant. And they were. And so after the meeting started and things seemed normal, I did my first 10 minutes of talking and I said, do you have any questions? All 40 of them got up and turned their chairs around backwards and sat down. Okay, when I get a gun on my head, I get really creative. I knew if I got mad, that wouldn't work. If I walked out, that wouldn't work. So I said, okay, everybody in supervision, get out in the hall. And in these meetings, I always had everybody in the line between me and the people in the room. So I sent them in the hall, got a cup of coffee, sat down, you could have heard a pin drop. And after a couple of minutes, which seemed like about 10 years, 
I said, fellas, this is pretty lonely. You're going to talk with me? And they all turned around and we had a great meeting. And what had happened was that their bosses had told them, don't make ways for Knowles. And so they were punishing their bosses and using me to do it. <laughs> so after that meeting, which was a good meeting, and we covered a lot, I brought the bosses back in from the hall and we had a little back to Jesus hour, like, what the hell are you guys doing? We're trying to share information. It's not okay to do what you just did. So I got very command and control. So I had to move <laughs> among these needs based on the situation. So, you know, sometimes crazy stuff happens. Sometimes it gets very hard. And sometimes I screwed it up and I just had to tell them, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And that happened a few times as well. People don't expect us to be perfect. They just don't want us to lie about it. Okay, other questions, Good observations, observations. Uh, new, sto new stories, new stories. Uh, um, Richard, I have uh, um, clarification questions. Yes, I sir. guess, uh, tell me if I'm wrong or right. I guess uh, your team members all had an engineering background. Pardon More me? or less. They I, all had what? Engineering. Uh, engineering, engineers background, more or less. That's correct. Okay, so the reason I I pointed this is that uh, I noticed wait, wait, that- Wait a minute, wait a minute. Early on, that was correct. Later on, I changed the way in which we ran the plant. And I had the shift supervisors report to me as my team, rather than reporting to someone else. So these are the men who ran the plant 24 hours a day. And so it was me and the shift supervisors. None of them were college trained. They were smart, highly capable people. And the plant ran very well with us doing that. But they are in a category of what people call uh, a tacky wicking yes. instead of a touchy feeling. Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, Reminds me a uh, classic paper by George Miller, uh, magic number of seven minus a plus two. And uh, your model focus on nine elements. So, yes. so your model is on a higher end, <laughs> but uh, in some other cases, you might have to shrink it into uh, five elements. So, so you have to minus two. Uh, I mean, the emphasis on people's dimension is hugely important. And normally it's forgotten by scientists, cyberneticians, and even second order cyberneticians. They, they, they kind of uh, neg uh, neglected uh, the people dimension. So, so my suggestion is if you could submit uh, your work to a different organization named the Organization Development Network. They're having huge conferences, like thousands of participants every year. And they had a very good book uh, named uh, the ha Change Handbook. Uh, when I encountered them, the, handbook, first, the first version, they had 18 different methodology there. And when I leave them, and like a few years later, the methodology increased to 61. And we add a 62nd one. And your, your model here could be the 63rd. I mean, Stuart had a, a famous quotation saying that uh, models are neither right or wrong. They are just more or less useful. So, so I think your model here is very much useful a little bit of linked to, towards the technology people, but uh, but the steer is a nine element. It's, it's within the range of a seven minus plus two. Okay, let me talk about that. There are a couple of things I think that are really important to keep in mind. One of them is that when we use the model, we keep it posted so everybody can see it. So we're not depending on memory. Kanban. The other thing is all we have done is label the natural processes with the people already know and do. And so in a sense, we just help them have some numbers or some names to put on what they already know how to do. And so the processes say, you know, what are we trying to do? 
what are our ground rules? People get that very quickly. I've never had a problem with people grasping this. The groups that get it quickest are the people closest to the work. The groups that struggle with it most are the really highly educated people who have edu invested a huge amount into their work area. And it's hard for them to spread out sometimes. And so they get caught up in it. But people, I've not run into that problem where people can only remember seven or five or whatever. We keep it posted, but these are the labels on things they already know how to do at a deep level, the natural process. All we did is tell you what the name is. That seems to help a great deal. So I haven't felt the need to trim it down. And I'm a fearful if I did, we start dropping off important pieces of the whole picture that we need to keep in mind. No, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean, you can adjust the model into a dynamic, flexible format so that sure. it's not just for the chemical uh, faculty industry, but it's, it can also work in church and the yeah. Congress. I mean, Absolutely uh, I mean uh, you, you, you can uh, twist a little, little bit and uh, provide uh, different versions. And my next question is, uh, how would you uh, compare this thing with, let's say, Edward Deming's uh, total quality management and all the way to ISO uh, 9000 uh, uh, certification processes. And also, uh, Jamie mentioned uh, Jack Welch. Jack Welch, they use the different methodology they call work out. Uh, that is more or less similar in the same line with with your model, but it's not a, that um, straightforward. What, what I find happening is that people don't have trouble playing with this and working with it and keeping it dynamic. And it's fractal. I can use it at any level of scale, like for my family or for a big organization. We can work on any problem because it's about how people choose to work. So I've done it in churches. I've done it in city governments. I've done it in children's homes. I've done it in factories. It doesn't seem to matter. I did some lectures in Malaysia for the School of Higher Education about this thing and brought the people together. So it's it works in any situation because it's how do people choose to work together? It's not what is the particular technology. That's, you know, that's, that's the part that takes place over here. You know, how do you organize it? to do cost sheets, how do you print the cost sheet? I don't know how to do that. But this stuff here is very consistent across organizations across the world. So consistent that sometimes I'm tempted to just write the process enneagram down without even talking to them. And I'm often about 90% correct just because the patterns are so doggone consistent. If I could just add to what Richard does uh, in relation to Jason's question about seven plus or minus two. It's really three layers. It's the self-organization le level. And as any engineer knows, you need three points to find the center. So there's the self-organization, there's the command and control, and what I call the image level. Each of them are our triangle where you're able to find a center. What I like about what Richard does is you combine what engineers are taught to do, which is you throw out complexity to solve a problem that you can solve. By putting the spherical nature of three triangles, you're able to see a whole. And thus, you're, that's the leadership dance. I'm into self-organization. No, no, I'm in command control. No, no, I need to talk you know, in the image. So it, it's a flexibility of management organizational communications that I find so powerful. Um, Bernard like Scott wanted the, to talk. Bernard Bernard like Scott. I think what, See, what I like about it is it works. Okay. <laughs> Bernard Scott. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I already go posted a little message saying I liked your presentation very much, Richard. And I put the comment that Thank leaders you. amongst other things are responsible for the ethos in an institution. I just want to elaborate on that a little bit. You talked about the, the organization being a bowl. The problem in many organizations is that the participants do not construe themselves as being part of that bowl. Uh, you, need, you need some, some the ethos 
helps people feel they're part of it. An example from the uh, first year of my studying psychology, I was sent to work in a factory for six months uh, to learn about the culture of the factory floor. What I discovered was that everyone in that factory at the worker level was on the fiddle. There was a bonus scheme and they all fiddled it. They all you know, made it made extra money by and, and did less work for more money. By when we talked to the, uh, I was doing this with a friend, when we talked to the manager of that department later on, one of the senior managements, he said, oh no, we don't have any fiddling in our, in our, in our firm. Uh, there was one or two, there was an instance a couple of years ago and the chat was dismissed. It just showed a complete blindness from the management side as to how, what was actually happening on the uh, factory floor. So that's, you know, the, the workers are not seeing themselves in a uh, positive way as, as members of the institution. It's there to be exploited. That's an, an example. Another example is working in a hospital uh, on, on a large project organized by a chap called Reg Revens, uh, who invented action learning way back in the, in the 50s and 60s. And uh, in the study of the hospital I did, I looked at one, one ward and I, I, I interviewed the, the, the ward and all the services, must have been 10 or 12, you know, x-ray and pathology and so on, but, that uh, worked with that ward. And I discovered every, every, every part of the organization had different conflicting perceptions out of how the other parts of the organization worked. And there's a lot of blame going on, a lot of ne negative thinking, which, which was quite unwarranted because it, uh, most of the communication breakdowns which were happening were inadvertent. And I did eventually, with the help of my supervisor, convene a, a meeting of the department heads, well, and Sigmund others, and I understand it had some, uh, made some progress to, um, to, to improve things. But, but just back to the, the, the theme of the leaders and the ethos, the final comment is a study by the epidemiologist Michael Rutter in the UK uh, in the 1980s, in which he studied um, many, many secondary schools. And he's, he's, he compared statistics for the performance of schools in different demographic areas. And his main conclusion was that it's not the demographic area which leads to school failures, whether it's in a poor area or middle-class area, it's the uh, leadership, in particular, the leadership of the head, the head teacher who establish, establishes a, the ethos, positive or negative. So I just want to emphasize that part of the leadership is to be that the, the human being who's got the human values and like, as you have emphasized, who walks around and sees what's going on. Thank you. Let me, Thank let you, me Bernard. Little, let me speak to that a little bit. The leader, is, you're absolutely right in their studies. It's, it depends on the leader. The leader sets the conditions. And he leader takes a command and control position. You know, we're going to openly share information. We're going to talk together. We're going to do these things. We're going to listen. We're going to help. But then allows that to happen and make sure that it does happen. That's the leader's role. At the plant where I was in West Virginia, we had lots of stovepipes. And I've spent a good bit of time drilling holes through those things. So anybody could go and talk to anybody in any organization about any problem they had. And I encourage that. And sometimes if I was talking with someone and they said, well, I'm afraid to go over there. I said, well, let's go together. And I walk them together over and sit down with the other person and begin the conversation. So we tried to drill holes in that. Now I'm working within the big DuPont company, which was not like that. And occasionally I got into some hot water because some of my people would begin to talk to people that the corporate folks thought was out of bounds. And I catch hell for that. But most of the time on the plant, everybody could talk to anybody they needed to to find out what they needed. And, and the stovepipes, we had expertise. You've got to have expertise in how to run payrolls or how to run a process, all that, or how to drive a locomotive. But everybody could talk to everybody. And that made a huge difference. And as I walked around the plant, I was helping to set the standard. You can talk to anybody and it's okay. The stovepipes shut down information. Information flow is like blood flow in the organization. If we screw up the information flow, 
we have a mess on our hands. That's why the command and control piece gets messed up. If we shut down information, we wind up getting a bunch of dysfunctional behaviors because people get angry. And so they pick on one another. But another piece that happens is that it's a huge piece and it's invisible. And that is as information is flowing and people are talking together and learning together, new ideas begin to bubble up that nobody had before. Now, if you're picking on me, I won't talk to you. But if we, you and I have an open relationship and we're talking together, new things happen. And so for example, I have a good friend who used to be in the nuclear Navy. He was a skipper of ships and got good awards for his work with the people. And when he retired, he began to work for Consolidated Edison in New York. And he had a big maintenance group. And the unions in New York are tough. But he worked with the men and the women in the union. And he built strong relationships and they began to talk together much more. One of their jobs was to overhaul powerhouses, which was a three month project. They go from one to the next and the routines are pretty much the same. As the men and women began to talk together, they said, well, we can do this better and that better. And pretty soon they cut the cycle time from three months to one month. That is a huge savings of money, which nobody knew was on the table, but was available because people could talk. How much money is lost because people aren't able to talk is a big question I have. I think it must be a staggering amount of money that's lost because people aren't talking together. People are playing games with the system like you talked about. There's no excuse for a manager to not know that people are playing games. The only reason they can say that is they sit in their office all day long and, and pretend the world is something else than what it really is. If I could just uh, tell us a quick story in my research on the American Revolution. Uh, when George Washington was wanted to become, uh, he did not want, but people wanted him to become king. And he says, no, I'm not king, I'm not emperor. What the hell do I call myself? And what the title he chose was from this little college called uh, Harvard that wanted to change the way education was from Europe. And they talked about uh, what title they did. They said, well, the title should be president. A president makes sure people are present. That's why George Washington chose the title of president. He wanted to make sure everyone in America was present to allow and ensure, as you said, Richard, the people to see all around them. It's just making sure people are checking there. Are you present, Hamish? Are you present, Jason? Are you present? That was the, the title of this experiment called America because he didn't want to be called king. He didn't want to be the top dog. He just wanted to make sure people are around. Well, one of the problems I think that has occurred is that a good phrase it's heard many, many times is, it's a need to know basis. That person only needs to know. What does he need to know? Well, how do you know what that person needs to know? How do you know what is necessary? Who owns what knowledge? And what, how, how do you deal with the knowledge? And if you look at command and control structures, particularly in certain areas, in, in, for example, in, in, in military, but not just in military, in politics, one of the favorite defense mechanisms is, oh, it's a, it's a, a needs to know basis. Well, so many things that are needs to know are not known because the people that know are not there to say it. I had an experience with that, Hamish. I was operating under, what do people need to know? I was getting all kind of mail. What do people need to know? To whom should I send it? And I had the same reaction. I said, I don't know what the hell they need to know. So I gave it all out. Everybody could see everything. And one of the funny things that happened was that when we began to share lots and lots of information, the people on the plant discovered that we on the leadership team didn't know what the hell we were doing a lot of the time. And it scared them. And they figured out they better help us. If I could ask Marty Jacobs, he had an interesting comment about teaching people how to think critically. Marty? You, you need to unmute. Yes. Yeah, don't we all do that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I've 
read Margaret Wheatley's work and, you know, familiar with Greg Reven and, and all that. Um, but it, to me, it's really about um, helping people think differently, you know, in the command and control, um, you know, as you were saying, you know, it's on this need to know basis. Well, you know, how do you know what they need to know? Um, so it's really about, you know, rather than having people just blindly follow, um, you know, commands, instructions, um, you know, when they get into a situation, they can actually think about, okay, well, what is it that we need to do? I mean, everything is uncertain in this world. It's really not easily predicted. Um, so, I mean, and in, in, in the work I've done, um, you know, I've been looking at sort of, you know, different levels of learning. So single loop, double loop, triple loop. And, you know, it's that triple loop learning where people start to really um, think in a way that um, can address a lot of the complexity we're dealing with in society. Um, you know, it, I just, um, I'm, I'm doing a presentation tomorrow, tomorrow night for a, um, a, it's a school in, in um, Argentina um, that is mostly engineers, but, um, you know, I'm talking about learning in complexity in times of complexity. And uh, I, you know, I always go back to the Einstein quote about, and, and I never have it exactly, it's, it's, I looked it up, but I can never remember it exactly, but basically that we can't solve um, our current problems at the level of thinking that they were created. So there's always this need to develop, um, um, you know, higher levels of learning and higher levels of thinking. Uh, and, that, and that's a real challenge. I mean, I, um, I can't remember who it was, but, you know, saying that, you know, there are a lot of people who just don't get this. You know, it's like, I, you know, I have the same feelings of, I don't understand why, you know, organizations still keep going with command and control because it, it, it just isn't gonna, con it, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, there's, there's this whole issue around level of adult development. And again, this is stuff that's come from my research um, that, um, there's a need to figure out how to guide people towards higher levels of adult development, because that's the only way we're going to be able to solve or at least address a lot of our complex problems. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with Robert Keegan's work. He's a professor emeritus at Harvard. Um, in education, but he's done a lot of, a lot of his work has been on constructive developmental theory. And um, he says, I, which I find, I, I'm not sure I totally believe the statistic. Um, I guess part of me wants to be hopeful and, and um, hope that it's better than what he says. But he says that less than 1% of the adult population thinks at the level of thinking that we need in order to address um, our, our complex problems. I'd like to believe it's more than that, but um, yeah, it's, it's so, so yeah, the, the way in which people think and how people think I, I believe is, is critical. I, I agree with you, Marty, and triple loop learning is really important in bringing that in, and that's the complexity stuff. But I've found that a way to help people begin to expand their thinking was to go out and sit down with them. How are you doing? What's going on? Is there a better way to do this? Get them to begin talking and their thinking develops. And after a few conversations, it's not just one off. People really begin to think creatively and begin to do things that are quite astonishing and are just amazing. You know, I talked about changing out our process control systems. We did 16 of them. We never ran parallel. We never failed because everybody was committed in thinking about what needed to be done and trying to do it. And, and I think it's, it goes back to a point that I feel is important and that is it's being done in the work 
right then. It's not as a separate activity, but it's in the activity of doing the work and making it better and them helping to make it better. And when they do that, they find meaning in their work and the energy builds up. When I first started at the plant, we were making two or three or four changes in the first year and it was a big deal and it was a struggle. As we all began to learn to do more and more, by the time I left, we were doing four or five changes a month and I was having to slow it down because I was afraid we'd outrun our technology. And we got to keep track of that because you can have fires like we did last night. So, but it's in doing the work itself, which I think in making that connection that is so important. And people began to get it quickly. People want to, people have good ideas. Most of our people are pretty smart. They do a good job with their families by and large. They can buy houses and cars and do all that. We treat them so many times like they don't have a brain. And when they get to actually using it, they enjoy it, they like it. So I, you know, I find getting out of the office, going out and sitting down with people and having a cup of coffee and saying, what's going on is a big well, step. <clears throat> well, and I, I was going to say, you know, absolutely <coughs> that what, what you're doing is um, both modeling the, the behavior you're looking for and you're acting as a coach and helping them to think differently. Yes, so, that's I mean, right. it, it's like you're a sounding board and it, it, you know, again, it's, um, I always like to think about, um, I don't know if Margaret Wheatley said this um, or whether it was Juanita Brown around uh, World Cafes, but um, the wisdom is within the room. It, it exists there. It's just a matter of tapping it and finding it. I, um, I, yeah, I agree with that. I think most organizations have maybe 90% of the information they need already within them, but they're not talking and sharing, so they don't know. I agree right. with that very much so. And it, and people feel so good when they're making a difference. My job was as the leader was to make sure, you know, we didn't go off the darn rails. <clears throat> You know, I, many a night I went to bed saying, well, I hope the hell we keep this stuff in the pipes. <laughs> so if I, make, if I may make another comment uh, in, the, in the realm of Lud Leidersdorf, um, there is this uh, political philosopher in England who kind of say it's all about conversation. And so the universities are the places where people learn how to join and participate in the conversations of humankind. And each department is his own conversation. And now some conversations just implode because everyone leaves because it's not going anywhere and others, they, they join. And so in this view, the purpose of the management schools or, or system science schools is not to create knowledge, but to create vocabularies with sets of distinctions or, or dictionaries uh, for Jerry Chandler, so that people can actually talk about what it is that's going on. So that the majority of people get it. I mean, they feel it, but, but, but they're just looking for a common language. And that the purpose of the universities is to create that language. But unfortunately, and, and that is a comment maybe for Marty, is that, that they're too much in control. Uh, the university itself is maybe also in command and control issue. And I'm wondering, and, and that's something that's being discussed now, uh, whether we need psychoanalysis to, to understand what is going on with, and I'm not making a joke here or, or a snide remark, but really that it is about self-understanding and, and that there would be a great move forward if, if there was a little more effort to uh, work on that self-understanding and then also uh, work together with, and I'm thinking specifically about Scottish uh, psychoanalysis of the object relations type uh, that has a language like about objects and relations and metaphors uh, to help with that self-understanding and how that may block us from be good communicators or paying attention to communication. Well, I think, uh, I, I think that, that. Wait, let, let me make a point here. I think, yeah. Jamie, you're quite right. It's the conversations. And I think organizations change one conversation at a time. 
And the metaphor for that is self-organizing criticality. If you look at an hourglass and the sand is dropping from the upper chamber to the lower, the pile builds up, the potential energy gets taller, and then the pile slips at some point, and then it builds up again and slips. Most of the slips are little. Some are middle size and some are big. That's exactly the pattern of processes of change that I saw as I walked the plant. I think that there's no difference between a grain of sand on a pile and a purposeful conversation in an organization. I was talking to someone in Germany a year ago about the Berlin Wall. And, it, and I can, thought, well, maybe the Berlin Wall came down because of millions of conversations on street corners and kitchens and bars. And one night, no peace conference, no nothing. Somebody went out with a hammer and started to knock it down and nobody shot him. And then everybody came out. That was the change that took place. Conversation after conversation after conversation. And so as I was walking the plant, talking with these 1300 people about all these different kinds of things, each of these conversations began to build and make a difference and things began to move. But most of the time they were small. Occasionally there was middle size and once in a while we have big ones like the conversions for the process control systems. I think that sometimes um, we mix up language and, and the ability to communicate. And I think the ability to communicate is, is more important. I know that, for example, if I went into somewhere in North Somalia, I smell different, I look different, and I can't really speak their language. But when I got down on the beach, when there were some fishermen there, I could join in, I could mend a net, I could work with ropes. I could find a way that we could communicate to understand. And I found in many places that I've had to go to, if I try to be me, as perceived by those who looked at me um, from the, let's say, developed world, I would fail immediately. But if I went back to basics, and thought about the sagas and thought about the clan stories and thought about people doing drawings and all the things that the Aborigines do and all the native cultures do, then there is a common way of communicating and there is a common way of, of learning. The problem appears to be that people do not want to talk about that because it's somehow seen to be on a lower standing. The, the outside image of academia is a progress of learning and pure academia, which in, in itself is wrong. It's, it should be that we're learning about knowledge and all of its complexities at any level. And to be able to do that, we have to have a way of communicating to each other in ways that each other understand. That not, it might not be voice, it might be through song, it may be through drawings. It may be through handwork. That's how it, we develop from the very beginning. We've, I, I believe we've forgotten or we've chosen not to do that anymore because we like to be in the upper echelon. We like to say we've got the different degrees, we've got the different things because it gives an element of, of self-perceived importance. But if you're working on in the middle of the Mali desert, those things don't help you too much. What helps you is the ability to understand where you are and communicate in such a way that you learn. So I feel that much more emphasis should be put on how we communicate and what that means. What I like about our discussion now and thank you, Richard, for bringing it up. It says, what is a corporation? What is an institution? And what we're saying is it's a bundle of conversations that can go terribly wrong or can actually release energy in terms of work. And that's a very different notion if you look at the corporate literature on what is a corporation. Um, and you know, I can go, go into that, but if we could be talking about not the therapy on the individual level, well, if I'm going to have peace, there'll be peace in the world, bullshit. 
you know, it's a matter of therapy of institutions. How do we get the therapeutics from the system standpoint to be able to take on the educational industrial complex, the health industrial complex, the military industrial complex, which precludes full explosion and interaction of information. And that idea of an institutional therapy is where I think cybernetics and systems is its next step. But that's my opinion. Other people, please, to respond to Richard. Let me tell another quick story about the build on what you just said, Lowell. Okay. I was working with a big hospital in Toronto where the SARS epidemic started. And the director of the hospital had her office on the 12th or 11th floor in a beautiful suite. And she realized she was in the wrong place. So she moved her office to the first floor to a small office next to the cafeteria and across from the restrooms. And so every time she walked into the hall, she began to engage in conversation. And then she started a process called her Rose Garden Dialogues. And she would sit in the Rose Garden for several hours, one day a week, and anybody could come and talk about anything. And as a result of those things, the whole place changed and became very much more effective and purposeful, much better caring. If I could add to that, Bob nicely here. Um, I had the privilege of starting up the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, one of our national statistical agencies, and I got to lay out the, the office floor as we began the place and lay out the whole organization. And I set up a space for a common area with, um, you know, sinks and refrigerator and a window and tables and so forth that was uh, two or three times the size of my office, which did not have a window at all. So it's possible to begin that sort of thing from the beginning. And that was remarkably helpful in encouraging conversation and networking amongst the, the growing staff. Thank you. Alex, you haven't spoken yet. Last time you did a lot of speaking. Love to hear from you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, give me one second. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, I, what a gift, this presentation. Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm very lucky to you know, have my small startup team with me here, uh, Sean O'Gary and Joseph Thorne. I'm not going to put them on the spot. Um, but uh, I think this presentation is really a gift, um, you know, as, as uh, you know, young people uh, walking into a, a very big and complex um, set of problems. Uh, I think this is an incredibly pragmatic and um, people forward approach that, you know, allows us to simplify the process of developing um, a, an organization, you know, falling into this kind of work in a very uh, straightforward way. Um, and I'm, you know, just very grateful. What a gift this presentation is. Um, uh, I think I'll be mining it for information and learning for another week or two. Good. Stuart, any comments, observations? Well, I've heard Richard speak several times <coughs> and every time I'm tremendously impressed. And uh, in thinking about what he does, I, it, to me, there's a, a difference in how you start. It's like I used to teach things like the, the viable system model and, and, uh, and other, others of these methods, system dynamics and so forth. And there you're teaching a technique, but Richard always starts, okay, what's the problem in the firm? How do you get people to talk in the firm? Now he's got a model, the process Enneagram, which is great uh, and very holistic and so forth, but it's the way he starts the intervention that I find so impressive. Good, thank you. Any other people that uh, were? <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to say something. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I'm Christopher McCor. I, uh, 
I've known Richard for about five years. I read his book, The Leadership Dance, and um, I just want to say, kind of bring this home to the you know c current situation we're in in terms of the pandemic. Um, I see the pandemic is forcing people to create polarized worldviews, and the the need for tolerance right now is like uh, really high. I think in in our civilization, um, and I think the process enneagram is a great way to implement that uh, uh, a code of tolerance. You know, just by using the first three points in the process enneagram, the, you know, the identity and intention and standards, uh, if, if a group of people do that, it puts them all on the same page. And from there, they can actually start looking at issues. So, um, yeah, that's, that's it, basically. Thank you, Christopher. Yeah. I will make an offer to be available to talk with any of you further about this as you would like. I think your email is in our uh, uh, invite, I think, yes? Or maybe you could just put it up on the chat box, uh, Richard. I can find the damn thing. It's, it's down at the bottom, it still says chat. Richard, I'm definitely gonna take you up on that. I'd be glad to talk with you about that. Right. RN Knowles at AOL.com. It's not complicated. I don't see the darn chat box. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. We'll take care of it. Yeah. Well, uh, could I add one more at this any, point? Yes. Uh, Richard, I, after thinking of your presentation, and I also have heard you speak before, and, and of course, uh, familiar with the general problems of occupational safety and health and the, their, the stresses they induce. But uh, in terms of metaphor, it, it seems to me you're walking around the plant and talking with the people, effectively the same role as the bloodstream supplies in, in, in the human body as it circulates among all parts of the body and delivers uh, energy particularly as well as communications of hormones, etc. So to see the leader uh, leadership or command and control as analogous to the bloodstream and its carrying capacities and uh, exchanges of information uh, seems to have some merit to me, uh, despite the limitations of the metaphor. All metaphors have limitations, but often they're quite useful to, to conjure about. Right. Well, I wanna thank everyone for their participation. I'm trying to get uh, Christina Engelbart, Doug Engelbart's daughter, to give a presentation. And that would complement what Richard is doing. Uh, Doug Engelbart's, you know, he invented the mouse hypertext windows uh, to deal with humans interaction with the swirling world of zeros and ones beyond punch cards, which I grew up on. Uh, <laughs> And his ideas of an ABC level organization uh, deals with how do you organize, not just within a plant, but how do you take on a complex like the military industrial complex and change it? And so I hopefully I'll be able to, she's in California, so he may have to change an hour or so of our timing because as uh, uh, Dr. Bakeshi has noticed it's early to get up from California. Lowell, the name, please. Her, her name is uh, Christina Engelbart. His name is Doug Engelbart. Uh, I met him in 1971 in Mexico with Heinz von Forrester. She was there <laughs> as a little punk kid. <laughs> uh, we actually rented a house together. Uh, so th this is a type of thinking on organization to take care of, how do you take care of something in an organization? The question is, we have organizations of organizations that create complexes that you need something more complex to deal with. So hopefully I'll be able to get Christina to give us a presentation probably in January sometime, maybe. Uh, you just uh, ask her to send me the towel as soon as possible so I can invite. You will be one of the discussants, right? Yes, oh. and we'll, we'll get someone else, you know, like this time we had. Hank yeah, we invite one more to, to talk about this. 
So I really enjoyed our conversation today. I think we built on one another's ideas. So thank you all thank you, uh, for thank your you time. All. Thank you. Doctor, Doctor uh, Meshkati likes to make <coughs> comments. Ah, please, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, ma'am. That was, in fact, in re response to your very good uh, question about MBA and the exchanges that we had. I have been teaching a course called Human Factors in Aviation Safety for pilots and aviation safety professionals at USC for 25 years. I have been following the case of Boeing 737 MAX very closely, sent testimony to Congress and a lot of these things. Back to the MBA uh, questions that was, I really enjoyed this conversation. There was this article in New York Times uh, uh, Sunday two weeks ago. I don't know if you have seen it or not. This, if you haven't, I will send the, that to, uh, to Lowell and I would ask him to it share out. it with you. It is a fantastic article, gets to the core of this conversation that we had about how Boeing lost this touch by getting uh, rid of engineers and total culture change and everything. That's the uh, debacle that they went through that. I will send this article to you. And if you're interested about Boeing 737, I have a Google Drive full of documents for my own student. There was a question in my final exam in my human factors class about this. I will be more than happy to share it with you. But again, I put my professorial hat here and I suggest that please read this New York Times fantastic article. I will and send his title, it. Give us his title. The, the title of the article is Boeing Saga. Let me hold it here. Boeing saga of capitalism. Gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go this ahead. was written by a New York Times uh, uh, business writer, and it got a lot of traction in that. And in fact, if you see my sticky note over here, I made a comparison of what Boeing did between case of MCAS with uh, uh, Babcock and Wilcox 30 years ago with the leaking pore uh, and uh, the problem that happened at Davis Pesci plant and later happened in Trimal Island. I think the similarity is eerie, eerie similarity. Good. We've had a very constructive conversation. I want to respect people's time. Thank you all. See you next week. What's up next week, Jason? Uh, next week, is, uh, you have to check that one. I have listed about the four or five topics. Okay. Well, next week is about Lumen, Lumen, and uh, Jamie will be there. Uh, Edmondo will be there, and uh, it is not next. It is. Oh, not it's next, next next week. August. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Check back my uh, post message, group message. Okay. okay. Well, thank you all for your thank time. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay, See you next Discussion. time. Bye. Thank you for having me come to the festival. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.